Hello and welcome to Southeastern 14's recap of Tuesday night action in SEC basketball. I'm your host, Chris Lee, joined by Blake Lovell and Max Barr. We have two games to get into that happened on Tuesday. Before we get into those, a reminder this brought to you by Bet Online. It is playoff time. The usual suspects are heading to Vegas for the championship. Our partner, Bet Online, is your number one source for football odds, stats, trends, and lines with everything from point spreads to hundreds of bets on everything from the coin toss to the color of Gatorade. Bet Online is the number one source for your championship wagering. Head to Bet Online and join today to get into all the action. Bet Online, the game starts here. Things started in Columbia early last evening, where we had a final score of Father 68, Ole Miss 65. Max, I will give you the floor to start on this one. What a game this turned out to be. A, a, a real tale of two halves here. I thought this this one was going to get out of hand there at halftime. Um, you're welcome, South Carolina fans. It, it seemed like in this one, Lamont Paris really needed just one more person to doubt them, to push them through. And uh, if that had to be me, so be it. Um, but no, actually, actually getting to the basketball here. Um, like I said, tale of two halves. South Carolina comes out and is shooting the lights out. They have just been on fire lately. Um, I'm pretty sure Talon Cooper has the number one three-point percentage in SEC play uh, right now. So just scorching high. And, and, and to be able to bring Studi off the bench – goes four or five uh it it's completely different styles but it's it kind of reminds me of how Alabama brings right seller Griffin off the bench and you just you get a huge shooting pop no drop off from the perimeter um so I mean man we we said it's time to wake up on the South Carolina team I think um Chris Beard said it in his press conference he said hey, the national the national narrative is kind of caught up we all knew in December us coaches but this team is legit um Still, story of the game for me was 7 of 14 for three in the first half for South Carolina. Then they go 2 of 13 in the second half. Uh, Lamont Paris said there was some uncharacteristic shots that led to easy baskets for Ole Miss. And you got to credit Ole Miss, too. They made tough two after tough two. I mean, Flanagan, Morrell, uh, Brandon Murray wasn't making many shots, but he was in there more for defense. Uh, but they clawed their way back in. You got to credit Chris Beard. He went to Austin Nunez. Over Juju Murray, kind of a defense for offense substitution, and they they found their way back in it. And and you know Lamont Paris said in his post game, he said, "Hey, this Ole Miss team has won a lot of close games. So a win is a win, and this is a good one against a team that usually comes out on top in these close type of games." So yeah, hats off to South Carolina. Um, man, that shooting is legit. Well, the shooting is the defense is um, even something else because even better. That's going to be what wins them a lot of games because no one's scoring more than 65 points on them. At least they haven't in six straight games. Um, and so what do you know? It's a six game winning streak when that happens. And so, yeah, the shooting's obviously playing a role, but it's, it's the same story where even if you get a team like Ole Miss that gets hot at some point in the game, you just still feel like South Carolina is going to make enough stops to win. And they did. And our guy, CMB, Colin Ooh. Murray Boyles. With another impressive performance. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's we've evolved from the big four earlier in the season. You know, I want to talk mm -hmm. about the big four and all that. We've evolved, and that's why South Carolina has evolved as a team. It's not just, you know, kind of a small group anymore. It's this entire unit that's playing. I mean, think about it. They went nine deep last night, and all the guys played pretty well. Um, they played the roles, they did what they were supposed to do, and that's a sign of a great team and great coaching is getting everybody to buy into what their role is. And um, that happened. And, you know, it's like just having an asset like Miles Studi, you know, someone who, you know, as we know, missed a couple games due to injury there, but it's still just his ability to make shots. Like he may have some games where he struggles and maybe the wrong matchup and all that, but he's going to have games like this where when you look back on, it, it's like, all right, those four threes were significant in winning a game by three points. And so, yeah, man, it's just um, I don't. I, I think the narrative's caught up, as you said, Chris Beard said, but I, I'm not still fully convinced. I still see people out there asking if this South Carolina team's for real. I mean, we're 23 games in the season now. <laughs> we're way removed from all of us just being stooges about them being, you know, where they were in the preseason. 
Like, guys, we're, we're way removed from that. Like, we're not having that conversation anymore. They played 23 games. They've won 20 of them. Let's not kid ourselves anymore. Like, I keep saying it. I've said it for, what, two weeks now. Look up. Like, after they beat Tennessee, look at the SEC title race. If you're talking about it without South Carolina in there, I don't know what you're doing because they're 8-2. and two, Great chance to go to 9-2 and two on Saturday when they host Vanderbilt. And then they enter a stretch that's going to decide whether they can win the league. If they do, it'll be one of the greatest feats in the history of SEC basketball. Um, but we'll get there when we get there. But for now, they just keep winning, and that's what you got to do. We talked about the Miles Studi injury. That came January the 16th against Georgia. Missed a couple weeks. And sometimes those are things, if you can survive them in the moment, they wind up being blessings to your team later. And you guys mentioned Colin Murray Boyles, who had the biggest play of the game last night. I'm guessing they were, I don't know, maybe somewhere from a minute and a half to two minutes left. Might have been a little less than that. Jamarian Sharp gets a ball underneath, and he's about to hit a, a short layup or a dunk or something. And, and Colin Murray Boyles just comes up and, and swats it away. I don't know how many times Jamarian Sharp's been blocked in his life, but I'm guessing it's not a lot. That was a game where if you watched it, South Carolina was up, I don't know, 15, 16 in the second half. Felt like it was in control. Ole Miss's veteran guards, Morrell, those guys make a charge, they come back. And it just had that feeling it felt like from TV hanging over the gym of, oh, no, we're about to blow a big lead, and this this is not going to go our way. He made that play, which I think was the biggest play of the night. Okay, back to the Studi thing that I brought up a minute ago about how that was a blessing. Colin Murray Boyles started the season. He didn't play, what, the first six games with Mono. They slowly broke him in the lineup. He did not hit 20 minutes in the game at any point this season until the Alabama game on January the 9th. Studi gets hurt January the 16th against Georgia. His minutes have gone 23, 29, 30, 20, 27, 25 since then. Was the Ken Palm MVP of the Georgia game two games ago. And then, of course, made the big play and had 16 and 9 last night. Just kind of wanted to point that out, that there's a big discrepancy in the computers and what they think of this team. The, the resume metrics love South Carolina. In fact, Carolina is now up to four in ESPN strength of resume after last night, which is just crazy. I haven't checked KPI this morning, but Carolina did not have Colin Murray Boyles for seven games or six games or whatever I just said. And then even when he came in, his role was very limited. They missed duty part of that time. Now that all those guys are here, I think this is one of a few reasons that transcend what the computers are telling you. The other one is that I just don't think the computers can take into account how much South Carolina takes you out of your element. I mean, you just watch them. And I'll say this, it just seems like a lot of times their offense is they will have Talon Cooper dribble out the clock for a good 15 or 20 seconds of a possession, and then they go. It, it slows the game down. I think it takes people out of rhythm, and those are two big reasons why they're winning. Yeah, I can't, I can't say it much better. You you you've got a you've got a great outlook on on South Carolina. I was going to talk about Colin Murray Boyles. I would cuz he was my underrated player of the year so far, but man, looks like you guys are all over him. Uh if you look at Ken Palm, he's he's played 61% of the possessions at the 4, and that was going to kind of a conglomerate of BJ Mack, Stephen Clark, Zach Davis, Duty and and now that they kind of have that that defined physical presence at the four with with Mac at the five and he can pick and pop, it just opens up a lot of things. And Paris said it in his post game. He said, um, you know, just because since we have all these guys, you know, we don't have to have everyone on every night. We can afford a guy to have a four minute stretch where he doesn't play good, and then he comes out, sees what's going on, and then is able to to get back at it. And so. Yeah, I mean, there's just a lot to like with this team. I'm buying in. I'm in. All the way in. Hmm. Just consider me stunned that the computers can't see everything with the South Carolina team. Stunned really? that they are stunned. not able to, you know, it's it's a real surprise that the computers are missing something on South Carolina uh, because, again, 
let's not, let's not even go into that now. But here's what's an interesting stat for you guys. Do you know how many SEC teams have hit more than five threes against South Carolina? They played. Did you get that? Did you get that from a creed, or are you just guessing? What have they played? How many games have they played? I would say. I can't have two tabs open one. at the same time. I would say one. All right. Well, you're wrong. Um, there's been two. Georgia hit nine. Alabama hit 15. Do you want to know what the rest you of the Alabama. teams have shot from three? And it, here's the important part. It's not even what these teams have made. It's how many they've been able to actually shoot and get off. Mississippi State went three of 13. Missouri went five of 22. Georgia went three of 13. Arkansas went five of 18. Kentucky went four of 13, as we talked about a lot. Missouri went two of eight. Tennessee, five of 21. Georgia, nine of 28. Ole Miss, four of 10. So, remember, Kentucky, Ooh. Ole Miss, teams who are shooting the three as well as anybody, couldn't even get shots off against this team from three. I think that is something you need to focus in on because when they get to the NCAA tournament, which they're getting there now, folks, um, when they get there and they get teams that shoot it well from three, South Carolina should be salivating over those kind of matchups because they know they're going to shut down teams that are shooting it that well. They've done it consistently. They're not letting anybody get easy looks and definitely something to, to keep an eye on here as they continue to move forward. And let's also call it what it is. How many good shooting teams do they have left to play in the SEC? Because here's their next five games. Vanderbilt, Auburn, LSU, Ole Miss on the road, which could be tough in terms of the shooting. Texas A&M couldn't make a three against, I don't know who right now. So, so again, just keep that in mind. Like they've got good matchups in terms of how they're guarding people, what they're limiting. And I think that's going to go a long way because you're just not going to get anything easy on this team, whether it's from the perimeter, whether it's in the paint. I like it. I like it for the Gamecocks. Bart Torvik's wins above bubble. Another another oh, stat. Oh, Blake will love uh, Carolina <laughs> almost to four God. wins above the NCAA oh. tournament bubble. They're not even close to the bubble right now. Not even close. I'm They're just a top five it, seed. My man. Let's not use the B word. I, I agree. We start talking just, about South Carolina. I'm just putting. And by the way, that's tied with Marquette for the fifth best mark in the country. Well, they don't play in the SEC. We don't care about Marquette. Get them out of here. They've got, in fact, well, Tennessee there too. Tennessee and South Carolina have the highest wins above bubble of any teams in the SEC. The next team would be Alabama, 2.9, right ahead of Auburn. So there you go. We don't need the KPI bubble above replacement Bob or whatever this thing is. <laughs> we don't need that to tell us that South Carolina is many wins above the bubble. We don't need that. We just need our eyeballs. That's all we need. We see the bully ball going on right now in Columbia. Oh, yeah. We don't need any of these numbers. We like that over here. We like all that. All right. Are we done on this one? How many wins above the bubble is Kentucky? Wins above the <laughs> Wins uh, above the bubble the Wat for Wat Kentucky. What by? Wins above the bubble. One, wow. one even. And it got oh, one last so night in our like hometown of Nashville. Um, I will, I will turn it over to Mister Anti Technology. <laughs> um, our well, Kentucky scored one hundred nine points via my eyes and the computers, so they at least met on that one. Um, the cats were off and running early. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, what do you say? It's just kind of, they were hitting everything they put up. Uh, unfortunately, Antonio Reeves had a great game, which we'll, we'll discuss here shortly. Rob Dillingham did as well. Um, yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but I mean, I don't remember exactly what we said in the preview, but I think sometimes everybody likes to focus on, okay, the, the, the weakness of Kentucky is the defense, right? And so, hey, we can find a path to Vanderbilt scoring a lot of points in this game. But I think my point was, that's great, but is Vanderbilt going to stop Kentucky? Because this is not exactly a defensive team that has been 
that good this season. And you just saw Kentucky get open shot after open shot after open shot. They hit and there's some tough shots too. I mean, they just hit some where it's like, hey, we're making everything. But Kentucky moves the ball so well. I didn't think they get enough credit for that. Like they just do a really good job of moving the ball. Um, of course, sometimes they don't have to. They can just give the ball to Rob Dillingham and just go, you know, zero to 60 in half a second um, and just go score a layup or something. But yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot to say about this game. Um, you know, I thought Reed Shepard should have played four more minutes than he did. He played 36. I thought he should have played all 40. Um, but other than that, I mean, what do you say here? Literally everyone got in on the mix. I might have to consider drafting Big Z again after this performance. I mean, the guy plays 12 minutes. He scores 11 points, six offensive rebounds in this game. Uh, he had a block, two assists. He did foul out, but we're just going to ignore that. Um, <laughs> but had three turnovers. Well, okay. Turnovers, come on. Turnovers are over, overrated. Okay. We're not we're not worried about turnovers in a game when you win by 30. Uh, who cares? Turn it over a couple times. You're still going to win by 25 or more. So, yeah. Uh, Justin Edwards, really good in this game. 17 points. 20. I mean, this was the kind of game, again, if you looked at the worst case scenario for Vanderbilt here, it was this performance from Kentucky. Like just being able to knock down shots, hit 15 threes on the road, shoot 58% from three. They hit every free throw they put up. They dominated the glass. Um, I mean, I don't have a lot more to add on this. Yeah, I don't I don't have a ton to add. Um, Chris, I figured you'd have some Vandy opinions, but real quick, I'll just go over some some injury stuff. Obviously, DJ Wagner and Trey Mitchell were out, but also mm. uh, Cal said Big Z uh, was sick the past like two weeks mm. um, and didn't practice the past two weeks. And um, that's been a that's been a kind of a recurring theme here with Big Z and. I've seen some opinions online about, you know, what's going on there. You, you also have to understand that this guy is coming over from Croatia and the, the, the food, the water, every, everything is different and it's much easier to get sick. And, and he wasn't able to practice the past two weeks. So finally got into practice and started playing more. So I think that we'll start this. What did he get? 12 minutes. I think that'll, we'll start to see that more often. Uh, the double digit minutes. Um, and then also on the Vanderbilt side, uh, who was it? Evan Taylor, Evan Taylor, six, six senior Evan Taylor playing through an ACL sprain, uh, playing through a, through some injury and, and had a, uh, you know, didn't have a bad game at all. Had led, led Vandy in scoring at five, three. So, I mean, Hey, not too bad of a game for an ACL sprain, but, uh, as for the actual result and reaction to the on stuff, the on-court stuff, Chris, I was going to go to you for your opinion. Well, look, there's some some strange things in the box score here. Vanderbilt has 18 free throws more than Kentucky last night. It hits 11 three-pointers. <laughs> it loses the game by 32 points. <laughs> look, Kentucky could have scored, I think, 130 had it wanted to. Not, not only the two key guys out that you guys mentioned – uh, but, I mean, you, you got guys, Jordan Burks, playing a season high in minutes or tying it. it, it there's kids on this team play, that played last night that I didn't know were on the team. So, uh, Kentucky was, what, 10 of 12 out of the gate on threes. Yep. Reeves was on fire. Dillingham was on fire. They hit 10 of, of 14 threes between them. Kentucky hits all 12 of its free throws. And the big thing, Kentucky is just so big. And Vanderbilt's front court, it's got it's Vin Allen, Lubin, and then the the three of us basically. I mean, Kentucky out rebounds in fifty to, to twenty eight. It just a just a complete stylistic mismatch, even with Mitchell out. On the on the Vandy end, we're Blake and I are in Nashville. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. That that fan base is so fed up. I think Kentucky had I sound like a lot most of the people in the building last night. Uh, Jerry I mean, Stackhouse got booed again. Like that's not that unusual though. Like even when Vanderbilt was winning, like there were still a ton of Kentucky fans. In the you building. you would but, have like, a lot, but you didn't have more than Vanderbilt yeah. fans in the building. And that's I, I think the fan base is just to a point where it feels like the administration is going to hang on to Jerry Stackhouse. I think it's going to owe him eight to ten million dollars. And I think a lot of people feel like the only chance they have of Vanderbilt making a change is just not showing up to games or selling to opposing fans. I mean, it's 
that that program is in a dark place right now. Well, I mean, I guess the good news for them at home games is they're going to probably still outsell the next three opponents on their schedule when they play at home. A and M, Georgia, and LSU. I don't think those three teams can be bringing a lot of people. Um, so Florida, I mean, so hey, they, they may still outsell the others, but the. Yeah, you're not going to outsell Kentucky and Tennessee right now. Um, be some Vandy fans making some money off those tickets when those two come to town. And I don't know what else to say. They're one and eight in the league, six and sixteen overall. I mean, find me a game on their schedule the rest of the way that we feel confident. I mean, that they, they could win a couple of those home games, just you know, because again, those teams are hit and miss at times. But I don't know, man. They're yeah. You just you saw the big difference between a Kentucky and a Vanderbilt right now and where the programs are at. So that performance was so bad, it dropped Vanderbilt from 186 to 201 in Ken Palm last night. Oof. What about the net? You, How many spots did they rise in the net after that? <laughs> that was good. I'm we, just we can I mean, look can it up this, if you really want to know. Can, can we look it up? Let's let's go to well, the computers sure. here. For kicks, we'll look it up. Well, let's find out how many spots they jumped uh, in the net. Oh, they only fell 11 spots. I'm, I'm surprised. So um, They only yeah. jumped 11 spots? No, they, they, they dropped 11 spots, which oh, what? is unusual. I, I like to see teams move up when they lose. Yeah, that's that usually way. how the net works. So, um, I'm just going to fill, fill you in on this, Blake. The, the net, it's not the number next to your team that oh, matters. It it's grouping yeah, it these. Well, I yeah. think it matters. The net, I don't think the net matters. <laughs> I think if you're – What's the lowest net team that's ever gotten in? 74? Oh, let's not do this again. That? Oh, we, here we, we go. Have put, we have brought this up 40 times, and we've never figured it out, so let's just not even bring it up anymore. I don't know. It's NC State. It's I out don't there. remember the number. It's out there. I think it's 74. Here's my point. that The number next to your net does not matter. It is it is there to group quality wins and quality losses, which, by the way, Kentucky has a chance, looking ahead a little bit, and we'll preview this game, I believe if it beats Gonzaga in Lexington Saturday, yeah, Gonzaga's twenty. That'd be a quad one win for Kentucky. Now, if now once Kentucky, if it wins the game, it might knock Gonzaga down out of the top thirty. It'd be a quad two, but just just saying. Let's keep going on this. So, Chris, tell us about the quad one wins and the quad two and the numbers beside the teams and um, the value that's weighted with. X times Z equals, you know, BS. Like, can you can you give us that formula? Uh, how, on, how do you suggest we numbers? do this? What do the numbers mean? Mr. So Alabama's Noel. a five. What does that mean? It means they're a really good basketball team. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Just wanted to hear you say it. Well, speaking of really good basketball, we had a lot last night, and it showed up in fantasy. It showed up oh, in South fantasy. Carolina, dropped two spots in the net after a, a home victory. Little update here. We do have a, a kangaroo court ruling, Blake. We have a kangaroo court ruling. The, the, oh, were, the, the court was in deliberation all night last night up into the late hours. What? Um, and uh, we they uh, they decided what? that, that <clears throat> since Mitchell would be unavailable for probably the week, and some outside noise from fans on Twitter and possible bribery claims, uh, the kangaroo court has allowed Blake to make a replacement pick, and he has inserted mm -hmm. Aaron Estrada into the lineup. Chris, you do not seem happy with the kangaroo court's decision. Judge Judy, <laughs> did, did you get kicked in the head by a kangaroo? Because I can't explain this otherwise. Hey, we this knew the risk me. of Trey Mitchell going in. And if Trey Mitchell had scored 60 points last night, we would have allowed it. This was well, a duh, because he would have been on the floor. <laughs> That's <laughs> my the, point. The, the, from the higher ups. If Trey Mitchell had not been hurt, he would have gone higher in the draft. Oh, come on. You never considered taking Trey Mitchell. Get <laughs> out of here what? with that nonsense. Yeah, that's that's right, because I <laughs> built in there. You know what? This is going to be all the more fun when this this smashing that started last night just continues to gain steam when Janai Broom takes the floor tonight. If you guys aren't familiar, Chris is a repeat offender with uh, taking early Wednesday morning victory laps before yeah. the Saturday games. 
and uh, that didn't exactly work. hadn't worked out for him except for once, to my knowledge, so far. Judge so, Judy, what um, what did this man give you? So I mean, was it was it pedicures? Was it you know it, it, what it, what happened here? It was it was more just a decision to uh, to to please the masses and give the people what they want. That mm-hmm. that was that was that was at the core of it. If you guys are that, that's the job of a judge to 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 please the masses and give the people what they want. You know, this is this is a this is an outlaw league we we live in here. <laughs> hey, Chris um, got a lot to say for someone who's won the league one time is not the commissioner and um, is currently <laughs> leading by a sizable margin and just had two guys go off in a in a way that you know was possible, but yet you know if they go off in the same way against the Zags, then yeah, sure he's going to win. Of course, he got the first pick. Let's all remember that. That oh. he did get pick one, and the person <laughs> who's picked first has won every week so far. So he's just talking, you know, the smack right now. He's yep. trying to to lay the verbal smack down on us, but yep. it's okay. I mean, Max and I are perfectly fine with our our decision here. We met in the esteemed Southeastern Fourteen offices, yep. and we had a great conversation about why I should be allowed a replacement pick, and the people spoke as well. Un, I mean, these are people who weren't even like unsolicited here. They're just sending in tweets saying, Max, <laughs> do the right thing. Do the right thing and let Blake have his replacement pick. And I will just tell you, I also want to point this out. I, all this praise I'm giving Max, he was also a little bit slow um, because I was going to go with Colin Murray Boyles as my choice. But unfortunately, Max did not make his ruling until after the South Carolina game. So therefore, I could not take him as my pick. So. Aaron Estrada, welcome to the Monstars. Um, watch out for Chris Lee. He's got probably some some kind of doll that he's poking right now with a, a needle <laughs> or something to try to make sure you get hurt because he's done that to some people here before on our roster. Um, but nonetheless, we will see how the the road tide do this week uh, as they have two road games and I had to settle for um, picking two guys on the road. So. I will say this. There was some discussion about possibly limiting your replacement pick to only the teams that play once a week this week mm, as a possible punishment. Sure. But but there were some late briberies that came in that quickly uh, persuaded the kangaroo court in a different direction. If you guys aren't familiar with what we we're talking about, we have uh, fantasy drafts up on the channel, about 20, 25 minutes of us just having fun drafting the teams. Uh, if you don't want to go check that out and get a better idea of of the inside jokes and what we're working with. Um, but yeah, that's the fantasy update. Pax, I'm trying to find the text because what else happens after we do our draft? Well, there's a we lot. We go about happens. our day. We go eat <laughs> breakfast, lunch. <laughs> My we... nine-year-old son picks from the leftovers. Yes, yes. And, and two weeks ago, he appealed to Judge Judy for a replacement because he had the same thing happen, had a guy that was hurt and couldn't play. And what did this man across from us say when we made that appeal? I for, I forget, but I know that something's coming oh, up. Oh, it's it's I'm trying to find it in the text. <laughs> All right. Well, we got to we got to wrap up. We got to wrap up. Wait we got to wrap three minutes up. for you to find yeah, the text. Yeah, we got to wrap up. <laughs> different rules for different people. That's <laughs> not true at all. Is your is your son officially a part of this draft? I, where's his team this week? I don't see his team. Where is it? You know what I Who's find interesting? <laughs> um, all all this draft order stuff. 